I'm Al Sacco. He is Brian Rennick. This is the 49ers Web Zone. No Huddle Podcast, part of the Odyssey Network. Brian, you know, sometimes I like to do some show beers. Today I'm doing a, a show whiskey. Uh, oh, okay. Some Weller's, some Weller's Special Reserve. Yes, that nice. is two fingers of, of show whiskey. So I'm going to do a little bit of that. And just just see just see where the next 40 minutes takes us, you know? We got is that, topics. Is that opening day whiskey? No, no. It's just... It's just my everyday whiskey. Um, all right. All right. Not every day. All right. Um, yeah, opening day is today for baseball. Yanks are up five to four right now. Are the Giants playing right now? Logan Webb is they, going pretty well, right? Early they on. are playing right now. They are tied 3-3 three, three in the bottom of the seventh. Uh, Logan Webb pitched six. Uh, Luke Jackson came in. They were up three to two. Um, he's limping off the mound. They just pulled him. And uh, it is three to three. And there are runners on first and third and no outs. So it's not looking good for, for the Higantes. Are you are you feeling good about the Giants this year or no? Uh, I am. I I love the moves they made. You know, it took them a long time. Obviously, they were very active during spring training with the Chapman and Snell signings. Um, I thought Snell was going to be a Yankee for sure, especially with Garrett Cole's issues. But um yeah. Sounds we're like they the were Yankees not old though. So they yeah, they were not uh they were not prepared to go over that uh luxury tax threshold so they were like nope we're good but uh hey the yankees loss is the giants gain so yeah i'm excited you know i don't think anyone obviously is going to uh challenge the dodgers for nl west supremacy but as the diamondbacks proved last year all you got to do is get in right you just got to get yep. in and then you can make some noise and and the way that they're built i think they're they're built to make noise in the playoffs so i'm excited and as the Dodgers prove every year, you can be built to win like 115 games and then lose in the playoffs. So exactly, it's, it, it's a crapshoot. Exactly. All right. One of the things I want to talk about today, and we'll get to it, is that we've been talking about Ayuk, 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 Ayuk. But there's a lot of 49ers whose contracts are up. And they have an aging roster and a lot of expiring contracts and a lot of decisions to make. And I wanted to talk about that and how the draft is going to work out because of that. But before we get into that, we wanted to touch on when we came on. We said we should probably say something about this this Eric Armstead thing because he had gone on his podcast and he said he basically felt disrespected by the 49ers and yeah. what they were offering him. A um, couple ways I look at this. If you're a player, I get it. Any job that you have, whether you're a professional athlete or you work in an office or whatever you do, if somebody says to you and says, hey, we want you to take a pay cut, I can see how that can come across as insulting. You're like, wait a minute. Yeah, I just played a great Super Bowl. I, I'm a terrific player. You want me to take a pay cut? But looking at it from the team's perspective, Armstead had missed a lot of games the past two years. Yep. He's on the wrong side of 30. You know, he's not in his 20s anymore. He was about to make a lot of money, and he was not going to be back after this year. So what it looks like the Niners decided to do was move on and use the money. It looks like maybe – I think they – didn't they ask him? I heard $8 million, right, is what they wanted him to take? Yeah, so, so – it, well, it wasn't eight. It was six with incentives that could bring it up to eight. Um, and so really, I think it's that six number that that he felt like he was disrespected. And, you know, I, I understand, right? He's the he was the longest tenured 49er. He was there before Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch. Uh, hmm. you know, he was a team leader. He was a locker room leader. Um, you know, he was a pillar in the community. These are all things that are undeniable. And he was really good when he was on the field. The problem for the 49ers is that he missed a total of 13 games over the past two seasons. And so, you know, it seems like, um, you know, David Lombardi uh, kind of summarized uh, uh, Armstead's comments. Oh, uh, did he? Did he now? You, well, I'm just saying he just summarized <laughs> Armstead's comments. I'm not I'm oh, okay. not going with what Lombardi had to say. Like, okay. you know, I'm just saying he summarized um, you know, he summarized what Armstead said on his podcast and what Armstead had said was that he entered 2024 with the hope to basically, he wanted another four year, $80 million extension, right? That, that was his hope going into the, uh, and, going and into the season. Ridiculous. Sure. You know, and, and it says that, uh, well, and then he felt Armstead felt like he was on track until he tore his meniscus against Philly. You know, he played through it. Uh, but it did, it did, you know, hinder his game. Um, and, you know, if he went in wanting that and then SF comes back and says, look, we want you to take a pay cut. Your base salary for 2024 is going to be, uh, I believe it was almost $15 million as base salary. Mm -hmm. Granted, his cap hit was 
much higher than that, but his base salary, which is what he was going to earn uh, in 2024, uh, was, I think, close to 15. So they wanted him to take what amounts to well less than half of what they were offering with incentives to get up to $8 million. And I understand his frustration because he entered the open market and immediately got $28 million guaranteed. Like he got $28 million guaranteed yeah. from the Jaguars. And honestly, I would argue that the, I know that the 49ers didn't do him any favors, right? When they released him, but waiting to release him until they did actually benefited Armstead because he entered the market after the Jaguars missed out on Calvin Ridley and had money to burn and use that money to sign Eric Armstead. So he, he kind of lucked out in that regard um, there. I don't think there was going to be in many other teams that were going to offer what Jacksonville offered. I bet you Houston would have been involved and whatnot, but probably not at that number. And so I, I get it. I understand. But the, the, the reality is, is Armstead also said, I don't hold any ill will towards the 49ers organization, the York family, John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan. He's not, He's not mad. He just felt disrespected with that offer. And, and that's fine. And, and he's and he's more than willing or more than, you know, more than welcome to feel that way. And, and, and I understand why he felt that way. But ultimately, you're talking about uh, a business and you're talking about a team that is up against a salary cap and has to make hard decisions. And you look at their pivot from Armstead, which was Malik Collins. They're paying Malik Collins eight million dollars. So. Mm -hmm. You could argue that that's kind of what they were looking to spend at that position, which is the starting defensive tackle next to Javon Hargrave. And when Armstead wasn't willing to do that, they said, all right, well, we'll have to release you. And they, they, you know, they went a different direction and they went with a guy that, that was making what they wanted to pay Armstead. So ultimately it, it is what it is. Um, again, I don't think, I hold no ill will towards Eric Armstead. I hope other 49ers no, fans don't. A 49ers fan? yeah, no, and if you're a if, if you're a fan upset that he didn't take that pay cut, I that I think you're in the wrong there because you know the market showed that he was worth more than that. So if you were at a job and you were the the longest tenured employee at that job, and they came and said, "Hey, we'd like you to take a more than fifty percent pay cut." but you also know that there are other firms out there that are willing to pay you closer to what you were about to make, then by all means, take that extra money. Do not, do not hold a grudge against a player who is leaving to make more money. It is their job. And if you were in the same position, you would do the same thing. And I think with Armstead too, when you look at his career again, I, like you said, nobody who's a 49ers fan should look at what he did for the team and have any ill will. Not only on the field, but off the field. He was tremendous in the community. Like he was really a terrific 49er. You look at his career early on, you know, those first couple of years, he only played eight games in his second year and six in his third. And then he was really durable. Actually, he didn't miss a game, I don't think, the next four years. Yeah. He was very durable. Now, the 2019 season when he had 10 sacks, that may have kind of fooled people into thinking he was maybe something that he isn't, which is a big number sack guy. That's really not his game. Yeah. He's not that type of player. He does a lot of things you don't see on the stat sheet. And if you take that 10 sack out, 10 sacks out in 2019, he only had 23 and a half in his other eight seasons. So not, not really his game. But mm -hmm. again, if you watch the 49ers and if you look at what he does on film and everything like that, he means a ton to the defense and he meant a yeah. ton to the team. Now I like Malik Collins. I think that was a very good pickup for the Niners. I'm not as excited about Jordan Elliott, but I am excited about Collins. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I saw stuff going around where, oh, well, Collins had better stats than Armstead anyway. And this, that, the other. Collins is not a better player than Eric Armstead. Stop. No. no. Full stop. Give me a break. I don't care what the stats say. Eric Armstead is a better, has been a better player than, than Collins has. It's not to say Collins isn't going to be a good 49er. It's not to say he's, right. he's not going to have a good year. Again, I like the pickup, but but stop. Let's let's stop trying to kick a guy when he's when he's going out of the door. Armstead meant a ton to the team. He was dominant in the Super Bowl. One of the reasons the Niners defense was so good for so long in that Super Bowl was because of him because of mm -hmm. how well he played. And we talked about it. I, I got to get the numbers now, but I think he's got like eight sacks and 12 playoff games or whatever it is. He showed up big in the playoffs. He always played big. And we talked about those core guys, Brian, who when the lights went on in January in the playoffs, stepped up, yep. they, which is a reason they, they've won eight playoff games in five years. He was one of those guys. Mm -hmm. 
Can Willie Collins be one of those guys? We'll see. But Eric Armstead was. So to say they're not going to miss him or you place it's it's fucking ridiculous to me. You are going to miss him. And yeah. I understand that he was hurt. And I understand that all that plays into it. I'm not he's 31 years old. He's been banged up. The Niners didn't want to pay that. It's business. I get yeah. it. But let's yeah. not be like, oh, huh, you know. Well, Good they right. just yeah, they're getting the same production for eight million. You're not you didn't replace him. It's gonna be very difficult to replace him. You might have gotten another good player who can do yeah. good things for you, but but you did not replace Eric Armstead. Like, give me a break with that. Well, so and the reality is, here, I was kind of like, yeah. And the reality is, is it, they actually signed two guys to take the place of Eric Armstead because while Malik Collins is just as productive as Eric Armstead when it comes to pass rushing as a defensive tackle, he is nowhere near the run defender that Eric Armstead is. And then they signed Jordan Elliott who is a much better run defender than he is a pass rushing defensive tackle. And so yes, Browns fans, <laughs> Browns fans right. think he's going to do either one. But what I'm saying is Eric Armstead filled two different roles, pass rushing defensive yeah. tackle and, and, and run stuffer. And now they've got, they have to piece it together because that one player is gone now. So again, don't, you know, this is nothing other than a, a salary cap casualty. And that is the reality of where this team is. When it comes mm-hmm. to uh, the salary cap, they've been so good for so long with so many top end players that eventually you're going to lose some of those top end players. And that is not the fault of anybody. It's not bad management. It's not bad cap management. It's not the fault of the player. Like it's mm-hmm. just the reality of, of a sport with a salary cap. And, you know, it's just time to move on and thank Eric Armstead for all that he did. Thank Eric Armstead for all that he did. Uh, as a player, as an ambassador, uh, and all of that, and and wish him nothing but uh, success uh, as a Jaguar, and uh, just as long as that success doesn't come at the expense of the 49ers, and that I feel like that's the end of it. All right, speaking of contracts and moving on and that sort of thing, we've spent so much time talking about Brandon Ayuk, and I feel like there's a lot of blinders on Brandon Ayuk, and there should be. This is a, a big contract negotiation. Yeah. He's a big time player. But Brian, if you look at the 49ers right now, they are at a crossroads. And it doesn't yeah. mean it's going to be a, a bad turn where they go, but mm-hmm. they have a lot of decisions to make. Yeah. So we're talking about Ayuk, Ayuk, Ayuk. Listen to these other expiring contracts that you have this year. And we'll we'll break into it. But you have Mooney Ward, Lenore, Hufunga, Feliciano, Jennings, Greenlaw, Banks. You kind of don't have a defensive end after both other than both after this year because a lot of the guys they brought in are one really one year deals. We'll see mm-hmm. if they play well, maybe they'll bring back for the second. Defensive tackle again, Collins, maybe one, maybe two years. He doesn't have any guaranteed money in 2025. And Hargrave is going to be 32 in 2025. It's just not Ayuk. There are a yeah. lot of places the Niners have to go. And again, they usually do extensions later in the summer. So mm-hmm. maybe that's when we'll see a Lenore get extended or somebody like that. But the secondary alone, let's start there. Let's start with the secondary because the more I look into this draft, okay, I think they need legitimately, they could take any position other than special teams. You know what I mean? Any any regular position other than quarterback in any round, and it would be completely justified. Because when you look at the roster, they legitimately have needs there. And let's start in the secondary where you have Mooney Ward and, and Lenore, who are a terrific cornerback. Mm-hmm. Ward maybe had his best season of his career this past year. Lenore is an ascending player who can play outside, who can play inside. They really don't have a nickel guy right now, you know, not long term or a third right. corner, I should say, if you want to click Lenore right. inside and, and nickels. And then safety, Jair Brown is in his second year. We'll see if he's a guy who's an answer. But then other than him, you have Hufungo, who's in the last year of his contract. So, Brian, if you told me they're going to take Kool Aid McKinstry in the first round, so, okay. Mm-hmm. Because you know what? There's a need there. And let's start there. Like, I would not be surprised because that's secondary. Depending on what they do, can they sign both Lenore and Ward? I don't know. But they need a guy there all of a sudden, right? Am I crazy? No. And and I think, you know, I I, I think the talk all offseason has been that they do need help at corner. And, and you know, w- we tend to pigeonhole it as they need a nickel corner. Well, I... I don't think they specifically need a nickel corner. I think they need three corners that they trust, right? So that they can run their nickel 
defense. And so right now they have two. They have Mooney Ward and they have Diamador Lenore. And then they signed Isaac Yadam, but that again is a one year deal. One year deal. Um, yep. And they've got Ambry Thomas. He's on, I believe, the last uh, year of his uh, rookie deal. Yes. Nobody, nobody trusts Ambry Thomas. John Chapman said, I don't know that Avery Thomas trusts Avery Thomas. That might be true. Um, and then you've got Sam Womack, who hasn't shown anything. You've got uh, Daryl Luter Jr., who was a rookie last year that didn't do a whole lot, um, was hurt most of the offseason, and I think that's a, a, a big reason why. Um, but, yeah, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of youth or controllable youth in, in the secondary. Uh, and then, like you said, at the safety position, it's really just Jair Brown because, again, Hufunga – is coming off injury and is going into the last year of his rookie deal. So, um, yeah, there's not a lot of future in the secondary right now outside of the Amador Lenore. Although I do think Mooney Ward is still young enough that to me, I, I, I said at the beginning of the off season, I think Mooney Ward, I think you should extend Mooney Ward for another three years and free up cap space for this season. They didn't do that. 100%. They don't need, they don't need to now. But I still think it would be smart of them to extend. I mean, and extend them both at the same time. Extend Ward, extend Lenore. You've got your two top corners, and now you give yourself again the freedom to take either a guy that that you love that you think is going to be a stud at nickel, or you take a guy that you think could be a stud on the outside, and then you bump Lenore down because you've already you've already seen that Lenore can be good in the nickel. So. To me, that's the route that they need to go is to extend those two and then use the dr use the draft to add more depth so that, you know, Ambry Thomas, again, maybe may even be a cat, uh, a, a cut this season. Right. Especially mm -hmm. if you draft a guy high and you already brought in Yadam and you still have Luter, who sounds like they're fairly high on and you still want to see what you have in Womack and all of that. So, yeah. you know, I think Thomas could be a, a, a casualty this offseason. Um, or at least prior to the season, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's pretty bare when you're looking past 20, really 2024, uh, in the secondary yeah. one year and, and Ward signed a three year, $40 million deal with them. So he mm -hmm. would get based on his play, uh, he, he deserves a raise, you know, yeah. three years, 45 or whatever. And then Lenore's mm -hmm. going to get paid too. You don't want Lenore to make on the open market. Like a shitload of money. Pretty good amount, yeah. So, yeah. So, there's, you know, that's something to really look out for and to look out for in the draft because they may take a corner sooner than you think. Then you look at the front seven. So, you think linebacker. We're good, right? Well, yeah. Greenlaw's a free agent after this year. And yeah. Greenlaw's coming off of an Achilles. So, you don't do anything until you see how a player rebounds from something like that. They're not going to give him mm -hmm. a five-year extension coming off an Achilles until they see that he's healthy. And the same thing can be said for Hufunga, who we didn't really mention. Right. Right. A year ago, we would have been like, yeah, when's the extension coming? Now we're like, he's going to be on the team next year. we got to see what he, how he bounces back and if he's even starting. Yeah. Yeah. So now at linebacker, you have Campbell from the Packers, who was atrocious mm -hmm. in past. So one year, and a one year deal. In one year, again, maybe they're going to they're gonna play three safeties to get him off the field in pass coverage. But now mm -hmm. all of a sudden, two. You may need a linebacker unless you like these guys that you drafted late last year to step in yeah. and maybe take over for green line. We'll see if they, if that's the case. Well, and I think that's kind of one of the things that you, you, that you do see this team do is sometimes address future needs in, in a draft when that need isn't as acute, right? So they drafted mm -hmm. two linebackers late last year, I think with an eye towards again, knowing, Hey, we've only got green law for two more years. Um, you know, we're not sold on, you know, Demetrius Flanagan fouls or, um, you know, we're Oren Burks, you know, we only have, we know we only have Oren Burks for one more year. So they drafted two linebackers. Right. And, and that's the thing is, is again, as fans, like we don't, we're not privy to how these guys are doing week in and week out. Right. We know mm -hmm. that they're not getting on the field, but they weren't getting on the field anyway. If Warner and Greenlaw were healthy, right. And Burks were healthy. Right. We knew they weren't getting on the field. So you also have to, you know, kind of take this idea like I don't know what we're going to get out of D Winters or Jalen Graham, so they have to go out and get somebody or they have to draft somebody. Well, they they did draft. They drafted two guys that they thought highly enough to draft, and they had a year to to develop. And so we're going to have to wait mm -hmm. and see kind of where they're at as well. So you know, I think with linebacker, they've got the depth there that they that they want, mm -hmm. and so now it's just a matter of hoping that Greenlaw can come back 
to performance this year and get one last year out of Greenlaw uh, before you move on. Uh, if not, you've got a fallback veteran option in Devondre Campbell, or you're hoping that Winters or Graham can even beat out Campbell. Um, and that's, but we're not going to know that until the mm. offseason starts and camp starts. And then you go to the defensive line, which this team has built around, which they've made a priority. And again, if you really sit down and look at it, there aren't a lot of long-term answers, which again makes me, I would not be surprised if they took a defensive end or a defensive tackle in the first or second round. Because when I, you look at what you have there. I Bosa, anticipate it. <laughs> right? Because that's how yeah. they build. Yeah. And you look, and you, so you have Bosa, obviously. Cornerstone, can't say enough good things about him. Malik Collins, like we said, one, two-year stopgap. Elliot, Gross Matos, Floyd, these guys are all one, two-year stopgaps. The other big name you have there is Javon Hargrave, <clears throat> who's going to be 31 this season. Mm -hmm. There is a potential out, but then I looked at his numbers in 2025 and 2026. His dead cap is 24.7 million in 2025 and 17.4 in 2026. And I know they did some restructuring with him. I don't know if this is updated. I'm on spot rack looking at this. Um, but I, I think, think and is, I hope yeah. I'm wrong. This is one of those things I'm going to say. And if I'm wrong, I don't care. Tweet at me. I'll admit it. But I feel <laughs> like Hargrave is a declining player. And anybody, sure. you just got rid of Armstead because, you know, he's in his 30s and banged up and Hargrave's been more durable. But again, he's not 26 where I'm like, all right, this guy, right. you know, the arrow's pointing up. We're talking about a, a defensive lineman now in his early 30s, like mm -hmm. not 30, like 31, 32, 33. So that's a little bit concerning to me. So again, I feel like none of the guys other than Bosa, I think that are there right now, you're going to say, yeah, cornerstone piece for the next four years. This is like, get us through this year. And then we'll hope that we can fill in. So if, do they take a D end or D line them in the draft? Maybe really early. Yeah. I mean, there are no cornerstone pieces on that line outside of Nick Bosa because they haven't, the, the, the pieces that they've drafted haven't panned out. And that was, that would be Drake Jackson. That would be Robert Beal jr. Right. So Drake Jackson, <clears throat> I mean, it, it certainly seems like, it certainly seems like Drake Jackson isn't what at the very least what they thought he could be. Um, he's still got two more years left, right. To prove himself, uh, mm -hmm. but he's young. That's what he's got going for him. He was 21 when he was drafted. So he's still really young. Right. He's still a young player. Um, Robert Beal jr. Again, a guy that I think they view in that, that D Ford kind of turbo package speed rusher role, kind of like Leonard Floyd, right. Where it's not a yeah. big guy. He's not going to be in on base downs cause he's not, well, at least likely not going to be as stout of a run defender as, as somebody else, although Leonard Floyd is also good against the run, um, which bodes well for him. But, um, yeah, there are no cornerstone pieces outside of Nick Bosa. Uh, and so, you know, they haven't really been stockpiling D tackles in the in the draft like they have D ends. They almost always go with the D end. So I think, again, that's something that you could see in this draft is, uh, you know, they may they may go hard on in on some D tackles. You've also got Kalia Davis, who, you know, very much was in the mold of a of a DJ Jones. Um, you know, he was redshirted his 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 first year because of injury, um, didn't get on the field a ton last year. But mm -hmm. now, you know, with Armstead gone. Right. Um, but they tend to plug this defensive tackle spot right with more with guys that they um that they that they bring in and and that's going to be the problem is when you pay a guy like Javon Hargrave you're going to pay him for the back end of his career because that's when they hit free agency so um yeah i i i i honestly you know we're we're going to talk about Matt Miller's uh seven round mock draft here in a second but um i would not be surprised if they went d line with their first two picks it wouldn't shock me i don't know that they will but that absolutely would not shock me just based on how we know they like to build this team. Cynthia always comes in our chat and says hi, and I wave to her, but I want to say hi on the show. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Thanks for listening. Thanks for saying hi. And if if you look at part of the reason for the defensive line, part of the reason is Javon Kinlaw, Drake Jackson, both were misses, and then the Trey Lance chef where you, could, you didn't have those first-round yeah. picks to sort of build that up. And now we're going to see just, just how good they can be filling those holes now. Um, because, because there's definitely a need. All right. Offensive. Let's move to the offensive side of the ball where I think, again, it looks like what they want to do this year is run it back. 
And whether they draft guys or not, I still kind of feel like what the starting offense is going to be is what you saw last year. Everybody's back. Everybody looks like they're ready to plug in at the positions that they have to be. They really like Feliciano, regardless of what anybody else thinks of him. Um, it looks like he's going to be the starting guard this year. But let's, again, let's look at it position by position. And the first one, let's go to running back, where you would say, they don't have any running back. They have the offensive player of the year. They do, but <laughs> this, is, this is what the show is about, right? We're kind of looking at the big picture here. McCaffrey is, he's been a transcendent player. He's been phenomenal for this team. This is one of the best trades they've ever made to get him in here. He has 798 touches total the last two years. Um, he's going to be 28 this season. So he is, he is getting up there, but he's obviously, you know, this year, again, he looks like he's ready for a big workload. But after that, in 2025, there's only a $6 million dead cap hit. Does he stay healthy this year? You kind of got to see what happens. Fingers crossed you get two more really solid years of McCaffrey. Yeah. Having said that, you want McCaffrey healthy for when you're going to give him. He's got 130 touches in the playoffs the last two years. Like to see them maybe kind of get some other guys in there. And you do still have Mitchell and Mason this year. I think the fans like Mason more than Kyle Shanahan does. <laughs> I think I like Mason more than Kyle Shanahan does. Because Eli Mason Mitchell can't is- pass protect. That's the biggest issue with him. Is right, he's not right. a good pass protector. And that is and just, he, he's not going to get on the field if he can't pass protect. And it looks like that's where it is because when he touches the ball, he runs hard. He runs well. Yeah. Um, Eli Mitchell can't stay healthy. Mitchell and Mason, last year of their deals, common theme. Mm-hmm. So, again, if you're not going to put Mason on the field, they don't put him on the field. <laughs> I don't care if you, you like him. They don't put him on the field. And Eli Mitchell can't stay healthy. And neither one of these guys are probably going to be on the team in 2025. Yeah. So if there's a running back they like, and I'm not saying you draft him in the second round, but fifth or sixth round, right? This isn't a year where running backs are going to go really high. It doesn't look like. If there's a running back they like, Brian, do they take them? Yeah, in the third round. That's where Kyle Shanahan takes his, <laughs> his running back. Maybe they could find a Trey Sermon <laughs> or a TDP. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, big, big draft hits there. Uh, there is one guy that I think um, could solve a couple problems for them, and that's Isaac Garendo, the the running back from Louisville, because um, he's a, a kick returner as well and a really dynamic one. But he's a big guy, um, and he is – I want to say he's like 6'2", but he runs uh, mm-hmm. a low 4'4". Um, so he's a, he's a dynamic athlete. Um, I really like him as again, an option. Uh, also the, the running back from, uh, Wisconsin, it's like 21 years old, but he's just a, he's like six, three, just a, an absolute beast. Um, you know, not, not fast, but, um, just a, a big productive back. So yeah, they're definitely taking a running back in the draft. I mean, that's <laughs> your, you, uh, you would bowl me over with a feather if Kyle Shanahan didn't take a running back in a draft, um, which is again, last year, but it made sense because again, they didn't pick till the third round. So, um, and they didn't have as many picks. So uh, I think they definitely will, but yeah, I mean, you got it. You have to prepare for the future without Christian McCaffrey, because Mm -hmm. like you said, you've got a year, maybe two left with him, uh, both in contract and just workload (laughs) you know uh the the workload he had last year was insanity and so you know if if he's gonna have if kyle shanahan wants to use him the same way again in 2024 i mean he's just gonna he's just gonna run out of gas so um yeah definitely need to to restock there um and and likely there i i think they will likely draft a running back and then one of mitchell or mason will be gone and that rookie will be um you know, will be will that. be the guy that replaces one of those two, or maybe an undrafted free agent. They or an undrafted free agent. Yeah. But I agree with yeah. you. I think one of Mitchell or Mason won't be on the team next year. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Will Shipley, maybe. I don't know. Somebody like that maybe. late. I don't know. Yeah. All right. So let's move. Let's let's couple in tight end and wide receiver together. So again, let's look at the wide receivers first. This year, assuming Ayuk is back. No issues. You have Ayuk, you have Debo, you have Jennings. You're, I mean, you're golden, just the same way you were last year. As you plan for the future, as you look in the draft, Debo has an out after this year. Ayuk, I'll, let's assume Ayuk is a long-term piece. Let's just assume he's resigned. Yeah. Debo's out most likely next year, right? We're just talking about other guys you have to pay. It's probably Debo's last season. They didn't restructure anything with him this year. And then you have Juwan Jennings was also in the last year of his deal who again if he goes on the open market he's probably going to get 
probably worth more to another team than he is to the 49ers money wise. Does that make sense? Like I think maybe, probably maybe. Pay the 49ers would. Yeah. Um, not to say he hasn't been a great complimentary piece. He has been, but I think Kendrick Bourne, Kendrick Bourne was a great complimentary piece for the 49ers. They had a price on that and he's gone somewhere else for a bigger role. So again, would I be surprised if the Niners took a wide receiver early this year? I would not because you have a quarterback. Finally, Jed York was even talking about we're going to have to pay this guy. Mm-hmm. And, and he's glad about it. It's a good problem to have. Now, are you going to support him with weapons? Are they going to get somebody else? Whoever that may be. Again, not necessarily a first round receiver, but second, third round. And I'll tell you another thing. If they, with how good and deep this wide receiver class is, if they don't get one or two, I'd be really, really disappointed. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and they will, um, you know, that's interesting that you say that you think that Juwan Jennings would be worth more to another team than the 49ers. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't disagree. And, and there probably would be a team that would, that would be willing to pay him. But, you know, I think one of the reasons why Juwan Jennings is so valuable to the 49ers is his blocking ability. And, and there aren't, you know, I think they're willing to pay him for that more than they are anything else. Um, you know, he is clutch. Uh, he is third and Juwan. Like, I mean, there, he does have a role. Um, but, but I think he is, I think he's more valuable to the 49ers just again, based on his skill set and what he's best mm-hmm. at. Uh, but there are teams that would pay him to do, to do both. And, and likely that happens after this season. I don't know that they would sign Juwan Jennings long-term, uh, because again, Juwan Jennings is not a guy that you're wanting the, what the role that he fills for the 49ers is probably not worth more than what they're willing to pay him this year, which is that roughly $5 million of that Mm -hmm. second round tender. Uh, But they, you know, they may look to extend him and be like, Hey, we'll give you an additional two years and, you know, we'll make this a three year, $20 million deal or $21 million deal Mm -hmm. um, with incentives or whatever. So, uh, you know, I don't think they're necessarily done in terms of negotiating with him. um, But, where's Danny Gray? Like, you know, that's a guy that, that I think a lot of people had high hopes for. Uh, and you know, Ronnie Bell didn't look terribly great. So yeah, yeah it just I doesn't mean, happen with those guys. Yeah. they're just, like you said, the reality of the situation is that the lack of draft capital that they've had the past couple of seasons because of the Trey Lance trade is mm-hmm. coming home to roost. And that is what we are seeing. And if people, you know, if, if you want to just chalk up the Trey Lance trade as well, just imagine that they traded what they traded for Brock Purdy. Sure, that's fine. Like in terms of a quarterback, they got a quarterback, whether it was Trey Lance or not, doesn't matter. But mm-hmm. what they gave up still has hurt the team in terms of depth and their ability to, you know, have players that are cost controlled for a while into the future that are, you know, f- those guys that they would have drafted would be fighting their way for starting roles right now, but they weren't drafted because they gave up what they did for Trey Lance. So um, that's just kind of, that's just kind of where we're at. Um, You know, still don't have anybody to, as an heir apparent to uh, George Kittle. Um, Don't have anybody. Yeah. yeah, Don't have anybody who is really an heir apparent in terms of wide receiver two, wide receiver three. Right. Um, yeah, there's just holes on this roster, and it doesn't mean that they're not going to be good. It just means that they are one injury away in some of these spots from from really feeling uh, uh, the. I was going to say feeling the burn, uh, but getting burned uh, in terms of not having depth uh, behind some of these some of these top end starters. And Kittle's a guy who's been a one man show for them. I mean, one of the best, if not the best, tight end in the league all around. Anyway. Um, really for a long time, you know, almost since he's been in the league, he's going to be 31 this year. Um, his cap hit is $12 million. His dead cap is 30 billion. He's not obviously not going this year. He's not going next anywhere, year. Yeah. No, God, God, no. And next year, you know, again, I, I think you get two more good years out of Kittle after that. I don't know. Um, and his contract's up after that, but again, it's somebody that they really don't have an heir apparent and they've kind of treated it as, you know, we have the stud and they've kind of, you know, Warner and Dwelly are just kind of guys. And Warner's a good blocker, but and then Cameron Latsu, who they brought in last year, will give him another chance, but he did not have a good camp. And then he went to injured reserve. Braden Willis, I know he's gotten in, but is he anybody you really think is going to be a, a star tight end? You know, so that's another position where if they don't address it this year. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a higher pick. 
but if they don't address it this year, it's something next year for sure. Like it's a major priority because you have a 32 year old George Kittle and you have to find that air pair. Yeah. And you know, it's a real bummer that they didn't have a first or second round pick in this past draft. And what I mean by that is, is the 2023 draft because it was really rich in tight end mm -hmm. prospects in the first and second round. And by the time they picked in the third round, Latu was, was the consensus like end of the like tier of good tight end prospects, but like the bottom of it. And, and that's all that was left by the time they got to pick. So um, that's kind of where they found themselves, but um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, this year, the tight end, the tight end class isn't as deep, uh, but there still are some, some solid prospects and, you know, with the wide receiver class, the way that it is the tackle class, the way that it is, maybe some of those tight ends get pushed down to more middle round where the, the 49ers would be able to take advantage, but I don't see them addressing that with a pick higher than fourth or fifth round. I would assume. Now the offensive line is the position where, I mean, I feel like to a person fans are like, address this, address this, address this. It's been the hot button. Everybody wants them to address it. The mock drafts I've seen most of the time, it's mm -hmm. usually a tackle going to them mm -hmm. late. You look at this offensive line, Trent Williams is elite, but he's 36 years old. You got to consider him year to year. Aaron Banks is in the last year of his contract. Jake Brendel is 33 and has very low dead cap hits, so they can move on him whenever they want to. Feliciano's 32 on a one-year deal. And Colton McKibbins is a the guy they extended who's going to be here for a couple more years, who's a serviceable guy. You get the idea, at least I do, from Shanahan, that he's totally content with running the same offensive line back. That's, that's the idea that I get from him. Do they need offensive linemen? Absolutely, from what I just said. You could argue they need five of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Based on expiring contracts and age and things like that. Will they address it early? I think so. But Brian, is as is, is crazy as this may sound, I also would not be surprised if they don't, given all the other things we just said. If in the first round they say, well, there's a D tackle or a D on here we like. In the second right. round, it's they're like, if we need a corner. In the third round, they're like, well, look at this receiver that's here in the third round. Look at this value. I can I can see that. So as big as an issue as offensive line is, as much as I want them to address it, if they drafted two offensive linemen in the first three picks, I'd be like, giddy up, let's go. Like, I'm good yeah. with that. But I don't know if they are. We'll find out. But I could I get the impression that if they take guys, it may be you may get a tackle late in the first round, second round early. Other than that, I feel like it's going to be mid round guys who they like to develop over a year mm -hmm. while they go, they run the same guys back. That's kind of my feeling. Of what yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, we talked about it with John. I, I think I've talked about it before. You know, it, it feels like they rec they are saying to themselves, look, we made it to the Super Bowl with this offensive line would an upgrade be awesome sure if it you know if it presents itself um well it didn't present itself in free agency because they didn't have the you know the, the resources to to address it and so now i think it's a matter of does it present itself in the draft and and i think again being content running it back again doesn't mean that they don't think that they could upgrade it it just means that we don't want to find ourselves in a position where we draft an offensive tackle or an offensive guard at pick 31 because we just feel like we have to have an upgrade on this line somewhere. Even if there are, like you said, D tackles, D ends, maybe even corners that they rated higher than, than, than who is available at 31. So really what they've done is said, look, we can run it back with this line. We would like to get better there. Um, but we're not going to pigeonhole ourselves into having to take a tackle or a guard at 31. Um, mm -hmm. It just gives them more flexibility. I think they will address uh, they will address it if if somebody is there. Um, I don't think they'd be afraid to pull the trigger. Um, but again, it's just you know picking 31 is not the same as picking 10 when they took Mike McGlinchey, right. Right? right? You are at 31. You know you are you are getting a player that probably has holes in their game, right? And so you're not guaranteed that that player is going to beat out anybody on that line. Even as poorly as you think that line plays, you're you're not necessarily guaranteed to get a guy that is going to, you know, that is going to, to beat out Colton McKivitz, even if you don't think Colton McKivitz is very good. Um, and, you know, most people don't. But um, – I just think, like I said, they the, the name of the game this year was flexibility. 
right? Let's keep the 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 core of of who we are, right? We lost one guy to, mm-hmm. to cap casualties, and that was Eric Armstead. But we're bringing everybody else back on a team that just made it to the Super Bowl. We're trying to run it back. We we're we're, we're trying to get some upgrades on the you know on the on the the fringes of the roster right some more depth on the defensive line you know some some more depth in the in the secondary but these aren't guys that we're going to build around right um and we're going to be able to take best player available in the draft with an eye towards 2025 and beyond uh, and and you know as a fan i hope that's uh, along the offensive line but you know, with this team, it, it's not a guarantee. And and like I said, it doesn't mean that they don't think that the line can be upgraded. It's just that they don't see the prospects at 31 are, you know, better than, like I said, a D tackle, a D end, a corner, whoever they end up drafting yeah. if they don't draft an offensive lineman. Yeah. And that's the way I see this draft going is, is BPA, because when you look at how this team was built, they were built with Armstead, who was before this regime, but, and then they were built with Kittle and Warner, and Debo, and Bosa, and Ayuk, and Greenlaw, and guys that they drafted that were homegrown, and then they built around those guys. In the last three years, the only guys you really have that are cornerstones like that are Purdy, maybe Lenore, Lenore if they decide yeah. you know, to go in there, to, in that, the way it looks right now. So I think what they're going to try to do is go BPA, try to find some more of those guys. And look, it doesn't matter where. I just gave you two off-the-ball linebackers that are core pieces. You know what I mean? That you wouldn't think at the time you would say, I'm right. going to run off the ball linebackers. Well, everybody but, that I would say everybody are, that you named, yeah. only two of them were first round picks. And that was Ayuk and Bosa. Everybody else was third round or later, or I guess second yeah. round. Second, second round. round. You never know where it's going to come from. It, right. You know, that's exactly it. They could take a corner or whatever in the fifth round this year. You're like, holy shit, this guy is unbelievable or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, we've seen like it, Lenore. So. Lenore was a fifth rounder. Right. 100%. They did exactly. really well late. Yeah, in that draft in the secondary with Rufunga too, regardless of what happens, he was a terrific mm-hmm. pick for where he got mm-hmm. taken. So I think I, I agree with what Brian just said. Like that's where I think we're headed as a draft. I think we're headed into best player available for the Niners and not necessarily like we need a tackle in the first round. So and there will definitely be people who bitch about that, who say, How yeah. could you oh, not yeah. take a tackle? You know, and and you know, they'll say, like, hey, so and so was available. But again, you know, that is <laughs> that is not that is not the way that this that this franchise built itself into the the contender that we see today and so don't don't freak out if your idea that a tackle is what they have to have and they don't go that route that they don't know what they're doing cuz let's be perfectly honest there are f- few front offices in the NFL that have a better run over the past seven seasons than this 49ers front office. So mm-hmm. um, it's not to say that they're infallible, but they've earned the benefit of the doubt. That's for sure. hundred percent. This isn't to say like, Oh my God, there are these problems. They're not going to fix them. It's just, we're a talk show. We're talking about the things that yep. we see. They, if we see them, they see them. And it's just a matter of what they feel is important, how they're going to build versus what you may feel is important or anybody else may feel is important. And that that's, that's the interesting and fun thing to me is I feel like yeah, this is it. This isn't a rebuild. It's a retool while you're still very, very competitive. And that's kind of a cool place to be as a franchise and as a fan of a team. So I'm excited to see how they go about it. I can't fucking wait for the draft. I, I, every pick to me, I'm just going to be like, so where in previous years, I've been like, I fell off fifth rounder. I'll see who they pick this mm-hmm. year. I'm like into every single pick. Like what's the yeah. plan? What are they thinking? Because everyone is so important. Well, and and I also think that they find themselves in a unique position that a lot of franchises wouldn't find themselves in if they were in a retool, right? And, you know, typically you think about a retool because you've got an established quarterback that you know is good um, and is older and on an expensive contract. So you're retooling around that quarterback. But this team is retooling with a quarterback that is 23 years old. Four years old, yeah. And, (laughs) you know, and so they have, they're retooling, but also they're building for the future because they still have a young and ascending player at the quarterback position. Um, and so it's, it's a very unique position that, that the 49ers find themselves in that there aren't many teams that find themselves in this position really ever in the NFL, just because it is a salary cap league. And, you know, once you, once you find a, a quarterback that, you know, you can build around that quarterback becomes expensive and Brock Purdy will become expensive. Will he be, a market setter like like Jimmy Garoppolo was maybe, but 
I don't know. I, you know, somebody, uh, somebody posted, uh, something on Twitter where, um, you know, uh, Jed York said, you know, it's a good problem to have, right. Where we're going to have to maybe, you know, maybe reset the market with our quarterback. And then someone's like, well, there's no way that they're going to pay $55 million annual average value to Brock Purdy. And someone was like, why not? They did it with Jimmy Garoppolo. And I was like, yeah, but that Jimmy Garoppolo contract was five years, $137.5 million. That was a $27.5 million annual average value, which was the top of the market at the time. Mm -hmm. But that was only 15% of the cap, right? Yeah. $55 million on a $255 million cap, which, by the way, the cap will go up next year. We don't know by how much, but it'll go up. But just on the numbers now, $55 million is 21% of the cap. That's, that's a hard, that's, that's hard to build with. And so I don't know that they'd be willing to go 55 to, to set the market. Right. I don't know if they will or not. Um, I'm not saying that Brock Purdy is not worth $55 million, but I'm also not saying that Brock Purdy is worth $55 million. And that's a conversation as this season continues, because we have one in a, we have one and a half seasons, right? I think we need yeah. more than one and a half seasons to say, yeah, I'm willing to, I'm willing to swallow $55 million a year for this quarterback. But if he repeats the same performance that he had last year, then by all means, you give him whatever he is asking for and you say, thank you. And then you figure out a way to build around him because having a quarterback that you trust and that you can build around is, is, is paramount to, to winning a Super Bowl because the 49ers tried to do it another way and have failed twice now under Kyle Shanahan. And so, you know, maybe it's time that we say, all right, the quarterback is important. And so then how do you build around that guy? And for the people who I know you're thinking, well, they can just kick the Purdy numbers down the road a little bit. Well, if you do that, after 2025, Bosa's cap hits are 42 million, 52 million, and 43 million. So mm -hmm. unless that gets restructured, you're basically paying two quarterback contracts at that point. So right. something to keep in mind. And again, the 49ers know this. Just something to keep in mind as we see contracts and things like that. All right, we gotta get out of here, Bri. That's yes, sir. It. For and and while we were while we were talking, the Giants lost six to three. The bullpen blew it. Um, but happy opening day to those who celebrate. Uh, happening, happy opening day to you, Al. I know it, it's gearing up to be a frustrating season in the Bronx. I feel uh, that way. But, but uh, hopefully, hopefully things uh, work out for you. Uh, I'm excited for baseball by the Bay. Uh, but more than that, I'm excited to continue to talk about these 49ers uh, week in and week out as the draft approaches. Thanks, everybody. Later. <laughs>